Hello there, welcome back to the Agostino Zinga show with I, your host, Agostino Zinga, and this is episode number 644. That's 644 of the Agostino Zinga show with I, your host, Agostino Zinga, and I hope you are doing well wherever this podcast may find you. I hope you are doing splendid. How am I? All good, all things considered, all good, all things considered. It's been a bit of a topsy turvy last couple of weeks. As some of you may be aware, I got unfortunately let go from my job that I was at previously. It was a round of mass layoffs that affected a bunch of us. I think at the last point of check-in, the only have two people remaining at the place I was working at prior. Everyone else got let go. I think there was like 20 of us all together as full-time employees, which is a bit hard to take and all that malarkey. And now we're all kind of out there in pastures new trying to figure out where to go. We've got a bit of severance money in our back pocket, making sure that can stretch and last for as long as possible as, as you're trying to find another job. It's kind of like this weird ticking time bomb thing because you know that severance money or savings money is up here. But every month as you just, you know, just, just exist in these days, it's just going down and down and down and down. But you're trying to accrue more money, but there's nothing actually coming in. So you're, you're a bit in this weird position. And it also is a little bit bittersweet in my case because I feel like in the last four years, five years maybe, this is when I've become, no, let's, let's, let's be honest, maybe in the last two to three years, this is the time that I felt like I've become way more respectful, mature and grown up with jobs. I think prior when I had jobs, I treated them as a means to an end and I did the bare minimum, sometimes falling below that because I always had dreams, aspirations of doing things outside of work professionally or career-wise that I'd want to do on a daily basis. I always felt like the jobs were kind of beneath me. I'm going to be honest again, retract that. I always felt all jobs were beneath me because I had this inflated, delusional sense of self, which I still have. I think it's important to be somewhat delusional, especially when you're pursuing stuff like I'm doing, because at the end of the day, you know, I'm just a flipping small pebble landing in a massive ocean. No one really notices I'm here, but I'm hoping with the power of consistency and maybe some luck here and there and hard work, who knows, I may be able to pop through into the flipping stratosphere and be able to get those Joe Rogan numbers very, very, very soon. But for the longest time, when it came to having full-time employment, I was looking at it like, what am I doing here? What a waste of time. I should be off doing X, Y, and Z. And then, of course, the older you get, the more responsibilities you have and whatnot. And also the much the better of a life that you have outside of work. I think that's majorly been a major factor in the fact that I've been able to kind of change my attitude to my, you know, day-to-day nine to fives. I think once I had actual things going on in my life outside of maybe me hustling, quote unquote, and pursuing something outside of me working, it gave me some sort of purpose. It gave me a direction. It gave me hobbies. It gave me interests. It made me um, just a much more well-rounded human being that's when suddenly I started to see the value in things the value in relationships the value in friendships the value in family the value in jobs the value in all those things comfort and as I realized you know what I actually enjoy every year if I could sit down and say hey I only had two you know leisurely things I do in a year and if you gave me one you know crazy weekend or two crazy weekends in Berlin going to Berghain and all these other clubs and obviously one festival like a primavera I'd be okay with a year that would be me set if I just worked the entire year round and I had the ability to go crazy at primavera sound festival and crazy during a Berlin weekend for two weeks I would be a happy happy man and I think you realize that once you get older once you're younger you just want to pile on loads of things for the sake of it and just make yourself busy for the sake of being busy but then all you get you start to realize that there are only a small number of things that you enjoy and you rather do those things repeatedly but obviously you do those things repeatedly you have to earn some money to obviously pay for those things and jobs really help and i'm from the school of working a job and then using the money that you get from the job to fund your outside stuff but you basically doing your outside stuff outside of work time so if you work nine to five the idea is to go home eat for an hour or go home an hour wherever it may be and work for let's say seven to twelve seven to one seven to two whenever you'd go to sleep and then kind of do that again tuesday you know monday to sunday basically um all the time until you get to a point where your outside stuff is paying you just as much as your job if not more and you could quit one and continue i know some other people there have this idea of like taking money i know this was some me and my friend um natalia big up her we we kind of differ on that regard she always says that she would much rather work a job save up money for six months quit that job and then use that six month money to pursue her outside stuff 
and then hope it pops off in six months and then rinse and repeat. That's what she had in her head as a kind of idea of kind of doing, which I think is interesting. But to me, it kind of is a little bit too topsy turvy. I'd rather just have something full time and then keep funneling into my business. But, you know, it kind of works the way it works. So I'm in a position now where I'm kind of figuring stuff out and getting it, you know, near where it needs to be going. And also what I'm realizing is that the older you get, the less glee and happiness you feel when other people are going through terrible situations. I think I used to feel that a lot back in the day when I was younger, or maybe a little bit more vengeful and a little bit more black pilled or something. I used to be like, yeah, of course you're suffering. Good. You're suffering just like I am. Now I know I'm not suffering alone and I'm not suffering in silence. Great, because I'm never going to cry publicly, but you're obviously going to be sobbing and crying all over social media, asking for help, which I'm never going to do. So it's good to see you going through it because I know I'm not the only one. But now I just feel compassion. I feel empathy and I feel somewhat bad for people. And if anything, it puts my lowly issues into really big perspective when you look at this story, courtesy of the music worldwide, which is absolutely wild. It says Spotify slash 500 jobs worldwide as dawn ostroff exit streaming platform and if you don't know who dawn ostroff is she's very prominent in spotify i think she might have been there since 2018 i haven't read the article yet i'm going to read it now but just going off memory i'm pretty sure she was there around 2018 2017 she spearheaded a lot of the spotify acquisition of podcast she may have been in the team or responsible for joe rogan actually signing on but i remember she was part of that whole slew of podcasts that first came about in terms of the joe budden podcast if you remember that when they had an exclusivity deal with them on the platform she was also i think the person that joe budden fell out with actually in the company because he felt like spotify didn't value his podcast which eventually led to that podcast breaking up and then the original cast members kind of splintering off into doing a new rory moore show blah 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 so she's a very prominent figure in spotify and 500 people in spotify is a lot of people also considering you know they've got a, a, a probably an employee base of like nine to eight hundred people no sorry nine to nine thousand to eight thousand to nine hundred people you would assume or nine thousand people so 500 people is a lot of jobs across the sector so if somebody that's prominent and as big and as kind of well regarded and respected in her industry as dawn ostrov this lady is like 60 70 years old much you know a lot of experience in the field been working at spotify 2018 have got actual w's in her flipping cv that she can go back to and say what she's done and whatnot if she's been let go also why do i think mr lowly ops marketing social media manager community manager guy cs and customer service guy like me why should i expect to be treated anything any differently why should i expect that let's read the article regardless it says here spotify has announced today january 21st that it is um the process of slashing over 500 jobs worldwide the firm confirmed to the se sec filing sorry that it's reducing employees based by about six percent across the company in the same filing spotify confirmed that dawn ostroff chief content and advertising business officer that's a hell of a title in it chief content and advertising business officer is set to lead the company too i love that because she's higher up they can't say they fired her because it's going to look bad in the cv so someone like that in that position you usually get a heads up that you should probably put in your notice i know that happened to me prior when i used to work in retail and i came late too many times and the manager liked me was like hey man we're gonna have to let you go but if you just put your resignation in it won't go out it won't appear in your file so if someone wants to if you want to put me on the list as a flipping um what's that thing called as a reference i can give it without really revealing what happened do you know what i mean so that was something that people do so i'd imagine on my lowly levels being a flipping sales assistant on the shop floor i'd imagine it kind of it's it's funny that it reflects itself from the shop floor to the c-suite it continues miss ostroff will assume the role of senior advisor to the company to help facilitate a transaction transition sorry which is funny you get fired but you still have to do handovers um spotify also announced that as part of the reorganization alex nostrom currently chief freemium business officer another good title and good staff soderstorm currently chief research and development officer will each take additional responsibilities to be appointed co-president of the company which is always annoying in these kind of companies right not only do people get fired and let go, especially during mass firing, so you know it's it's kind of a bit of it's a bit destabilizing. It maybe it's a little bit um, nerve wracking as well if you're if you survive because on one hand you're grateful that you still have a job and you can still pay your rent and go on holiday that you plan and booked and you can still buy people Christmas presents without feeling like you're on the cusp of poverty, right? All those things are really good, 
But then the other side, you start thinking, damn, now you're going to take more responsibility because all those jobs that people had and they were doing and they were doing them pretty well, they're still jobs that need to get done, but they don't need to have a dedicated person. So they're going to siphon off a few of the bits and pieces that they did onto your play. And if you're already busy and overworked and stressed out, you're going to be even more you know, overworked and stressed out now that your colleagues have gone. So you kind of have to suffer a double. You have to suffer double because you leave colleagues and friends and also suffer double because you're going to have more workload. Mad. Um, it continues. At the end of Q3 2022, according to an investor presentation, Spotify employed 9,808 full-time employees globally. 6% of 9,800 is 588. God damn, it's a lot of people. Spotify said that in the SEC filing today that the head count reduction would incur approximately 35 to 45 million in severance related packages or charges jesus christos because every one of those people is going to have severance especially if it's a european country they're going to be pretty good in terms of the packages they give people um most people have probably been working there a year plus so i think if every year that you work full time i'm pretty sure it's happened in the uk um counts for like a month of severance so you can just imagine the amount of money they're giving people and you imagine also if someone like a dawn ostroff is getting let go this mass layoffs is affecting people across the entire company in de different levels of seniority. So people that have been working there seven years, 10 years, you know, big manager types and whatever it may be. So those packages are going to be big. It's going to be anywhere between like a thousand pounds per month. You're incurring fees up to 10,000, maybe even more madness in a letter issued to staff today spotify's co-founder daniel Eck wrote the following over the next several hours one-on-one -on -one conversations will take place with impacted employees which are never good in companies you know very rarely do you have one-on-one -on -one conversations where someone tells you you're doing a good job keep it going push even more you've raised the standard you've been a great addition to the team one-on-one -on -one conversations are only to kind of you know pull your card slap you around the face tell you to wake up tell you the last warning remind you of the standards remind you of your responsibility scare you like that's what they're mainly there for they're never there to praise you or to give you words of encouragement very very rarely um, he said, um, to offer some perspective on why we're making this decision in 2022, the growth of Spotify's OPEX outpaced our revenue growth by 2x. That would have been unsustainable long term in any climate. But with the challenging macro environment, that would have been more difficult to close the gap than your ex said. And he also said, as you are all well aware, over the last few months, we've made considerable effort to rein in costs, but it simply hasn't been enough. So while it's clear its path is right for Spotify, it doesn't make it easier, especially as we think about the contributions of these colleagues have made. If, if it doesn't make it easier, why didn't you fall on your sword, eh? It's funny how these mass firing work out, isn't it? Leaderships are never people, leadership people like Daniel Eck are never the ones to leave. It's always the ones that he kind of delegates the task to, so that he's kind of underlings, he kind of lets go. But really and truly, if you haven't done a good job in terms of making Spotify somewhat financially stable or put in a position where they're not having to incur mass layoffs, it could be argued that maybe you as a head, you should be let go. It's kind of the opposite of football teams. It's like in business world, they fire the employees to save the company. But in football world, they always fire the head, the managers and the chairman or the director of football. Or sometimes the owners will get let go before they let go of the players. Always that way. Um, which is quite interesting. But I guess in football, the players are far more valuable than little old me, social media managers. You know what I mean? They can find many of us, you know, you throw a flipping stone in Shoreditch and you'll stumble across somebody who knows how to flip in, put together a content calendar. It's not too difficult. But one person I do feel bad for, I'm just remembering it now, actually, talking about Spotify. I do remember a couple of years ago, some girl, I think it may have been a girl on Twitter, went viral for wanting, so basically publicly declaring that she wanted to join Spotify. And I think this might have been during the pandemic, I'm pretty sure. And she put together a pretty sick CV in the style of Spotify's UX, UI. I guess she was a designer, I'm pretty sure. And um, it went viral and everyone was sharing. I'm going to go look how great she's done this. And then I think she was already applying for Spotify anyway. But then they basically fast-tracked her employment, uh, sorry, her application. And then she announced on Twitter, oh my God, I got my job, doing dream job. I went to Spotify all this time, blah, blah, blah. And everyone was happy for her. And then I think I saw recently a post where she kind of retweeted that comment that she made with the Spotify themed CV and said, oh, I've been let go. I'm crushed. Like, do you know what I mean? Like, absolutely broken. And considering I'm going through the same thing, I think in days gone by, I would have been happy and gleeful that everybody else is suffering while I'm suffering. But I can't help but feel sorry for people, do you know what I mean? In this kind of level, going through what they've gone through. And it also makes you wonder, what would I have, what would I have preferred or what would most people prefer? getting let go before christmas which is the end of q4 
or getting let go as you come into Q1 at the beginning of the year. So getting let go before Christmas, you're looking forward to the holidays, you maybe haven't bought your presents yet, you're getting those kind of things sorted out, you might have to go visit family in far-flung places, or bring gifts, or just spend money during Christmas like people do because it's Christmas, people get a bit free with the wallet, or you rather get fired in the new year when you're trying to plan the new year, you're put together some new, some new resolutions, you're trying to focus on things that you want to do in your career, you've got all these plans and goals in place, and then boom, you get hit with the hammer of, of being laid off. What would you prefer? Before Christmas or after Christmas? Because I don't really know. Because I thought my, mine was like te technically before Christmas, um, but it all got kind of finalized the end of this month. And it's kind of feeling a little bit weird. But I think I prefer it the quicker the, the quicker they get it done, the better. This, as soon as the owners find out, I think it's best they communicate with people and say, hey, this is what the situation is. We let people go so that you can start adjusting uh, mentally, physically, practically and whatnot going forward. But one thing I have to say is really valuable in these situations. I think I've seen it on both ends, the good and the bad. In this situation, it was handled pretty well, I think, because I think as Danny Wack mentioned in his article, you know, they tried everything in order to make it work and it didn't work. And same happened with my company. I saw the manager, sorry, I saw the owner like legitimately wither away in front of our eyes. His eyes, you know, the bags under his eyes became more prominent. He had more hollow, buco, fat cheeked look to him. He was pacing up and down, always on the phone, always on the email. Just look like he was always on the go, 24 7, trying to make it work until the very end. And it didn't happen. And I think that goes a long way. And of course, when it came to, you know, announcing everything and he did it all by the book, very professionally done, um, as emotional as it was, he kind of removed all the emotion and just kind of tried to be as helpful as possible and put himself forward and whatnot. And also faced it up personally, didn't avoid people, didn't not come into the office, like was like, you know, available to talk on Slack, available to talk via Zoom, uh, available to talk in the office, like just made himself personable, made himself approachable and didn't carry and hide away. The other thing I've seen in this situation, one other place I worked at where it happened, uh, mass layoffs, is the owner was just acting like nothing happened. People were going out and drinking on the company card. He was buying stuff all the time to buying pizza. All the stuff that you'd imagine startup people do. The pizzas, the snacks, the coffee machine stuff, the fruit baskets from that, you know, those companies that come through and bring you fruit boxes, everything per week and whatnot. All these little, you know, extravagances that you would imagine a successful startup should be having or, some, or a startup that has got a lot of funding. And then boom, we get hit over the hammer and saying they're going to have mass levels because we can't afford to keep the lights on. And then, oh, also, I can't pay you at the end of the month. So, and then I think we ended up having to get the payment, it, uh, you know, from the end of an employment tribunal or something, which was crazy. And it, again, it doesn't matter because, you know, maybe the first guy or the one that did it most recently, he was prancing around and being stressed out and looking like he was working. It kind of made me feel good because, you know, that's cool, but he could still be doing bad business. I understand, but that those actions do go a long way to kind of give employees, your foot soldiers, a little bit of comfort in knowing that you tried. But that whole just continuing that like nothing's happening, jumping into Uber X's and whatnot, and just living the fucking rich life of a really successful startup founder, knowing full well of the pending doom that's a flipping, you know, far out over the flipping horizon that's about to kind of hit us on shore is really despicable so there's no good and bad no good and bad way to do these kind of things you just have to do them and hope people understand and are grown up about it and can kind of bounce back but you know it's pretty it's pretty sketchy out there if people from google are getting let go alphabet spotify i forgot who the other people are there's other places too i forgot which ones especially but it seems like these layoffs are affecting people all over the place of course we saw what happened with twitter going forward which makes me think actually i wonder if a lot of these operators and owners of these companies have seen what elon's done at twitter and how he was able to take them i think at their peak they may have had seven thousand eight thousand employees now they've got a thousand right so he slashed his employee base by like 75 or 70 percent plus absolutely insane but i wonder if a lot of these operators were able to take all their emotion out of it all of their political leanings out of it and the idea that elon musk is incredibly annoying and a bit of an attention seeker remove yourself from it step back a bit and just look at it and think you know what he's actually proved that it's possible to run a company of the scale of on app or the scale of um twitter with only a thousand plus employees the majority of them you know um engineers and whatnot and you'll be able to do a pretty decent job so far it hasn't imploded on itself hasn't gone bankrupt hasn't shut down maybe it's on the brink of it but so far he's been able to prove 
that is able to function day to day, you know, week to week, month to month, year to year. So clearly there is um there is some precedent there set. So I wonder if some of these founders and owners saw what he done and thought, you know what? We should copy this the same thing with our field because, you know, the, the you can save so much money from salaries alone. So much. Especially if you fire people across the board and not just in one certain band. There's a lot of money that could be saved and kind of reinvested into really improving the most important thing in any business is obviously the service, app, products, whatever else that you're selling and putting out there. It's probably the most important thing to be focusing all your efforts towards. So for everybody out there who is suffering from the mass layoffs, big up yourself. Hold in there. You should be fine. You shall be fine. Let me drink some water here to keep it going. Okay, next one. Let's see. We got this story, courtesy of the Guardian, regarding a laughing gas ban. Going to be happening very soon. It feels like these articles pop up every single couple of months or so. I'm not too sure if it's you know boring um, conservative types or liberal types basically trying to stop any fun young people are having out there i'm not too sure if this is actually a legitimate issue if this is something they can't push through because of various other reasons that laughing gas and these kind of things are useful or the components they're useful i don't know but it feels like this article in particular gets recycled once every few months but this article is recent one courtesy of the guardian it says as follows Laughing gas could be banned from general sale with possession, possessionally, sorry, potentially criminalized unless someone has a legitimate reason to have it. Ministers are thought to be considering a move as part of the crackdown on antisocial behavior. The Times has reported after cannabis, laughing gas is the most commonly used drug among 16 to 24 year olds. It's funny because cannabis is illegal in the, U in the UK, yet it's this, still this popular. So it goes to show all these rules and bannings they put in place anyway don't actually do anything because people will find a way. Um, it continues as there are concerns about health problems caused by usage with causes where it's been linked to nerve damage paralysis or death i've seen a few of those articles or stories on shade bar and places like that i'm sorry but if you're a kid out there and you become you know you suffer from nerve damage sorry nerve damage paralysis or death because of a laughing gas you probably deserve it that's probably a case of natural selection if you're legitimately getting to a point where you're about to OD or die from laughing gas, you probably would have died stepping on your flipping bedroom frame or something and knocking yourself out. That would have happened equally as much because you are R word redacted, capital R word redacted. That's insane. Um, there's nothing that enjoyable about laughing gas that should be pushing you to the point where you're taking it to the face and it's leading to death paralysis or more. It doesn't make any sense personally for me. It really is ridiculous. The cartoon says only those with good causes to possess it would have exemptions such as chefs who use its products including whipped cream or for freezing ch chilling food. Sorry, The gas nitrous oxide is also used as a painkiller during childbirth or dental treatment. So we're going to have goons out here pretending they're midwives, pretending they're, you know, taking out people's wisdom teeth. Right, we're gonna have people here pretending that they have a what's that thing called, like a catering business where they make flipping wedding cakes for people and whatnot. That's how people are gonna get around it all, all the time. Like, oh, this is Hassan's flipping wedding cake service. Wink, wink. Balloon emoji, balloon emoji. Come on, man. We know what's gonna happen. The law currently bans the knowing of uh, bans the knowing or reckless supply of nitrous oxide from inhalation. Inhalation, sorry. Inhale, inhalation. Jesus, why can't I say that word? Inhalation. However, the British Compressed Gases Association <laughs> this once a ban on all consumer sale. I didn't know this even existed. British Compressed Gases Association, the BCGA. Mama mia. We love a good association, innit? We love a group of adults, you know, gathering around being flipping narcs and being flipping randles and snitches, innit? And telling people what to do and whatnot. We love it, innit? Community watch. Um, neighborhood watch flat watch apartment watch man get out of here before i push you off a building anyway it continues a review is currently being carried out by the uk-wide independent advisory council for the misuse of drugs which advises on drug policy the policing minister chris phillip who is thought to want it fast-tracked by to april oh my god so before festival season they're going to get this in a way because the government cannot act until the findings have been reported, according to the Times. This also goes back to my theory that I was saying that I think this year will be the biggest year for festivals um, going forward in you know this summer. Because I feel like last year, even though it was the first year post-pandemic, post-lockdown for most people, I still feel like a lot of people were kind of hesitant and 
resistant to going out and maybe a bit scared, a bit anxious. But now that we've got a full, so much, somewhat so a full year out of our system where we lived kind of quote unquote normally, I think people are now going to go for broke when it comes to this summer. So this summer will be an absolute busy one. And it makes sense because I've seen a few places selling through most of their first release tickets or festivals and whatnot. And, they, you know, people put a decent amount of those things up. So I'm assuming that is the case. And I think the police are probably seeing these numbers also and seeing the temperature out there and thinking, you know what, we can't have another summer or people getting too smashed up, especially post-pandemic. Because people's tolerances, like my, my tolerance is completely depleted since I've been spending most of my time indoors and not going out as often. And even when you drink or do drugs at home or something, it's not the same as being out socially. So whatever tolerance I did have prior has has completely been eroded and the issue with those kind of things are when you do then eventually go outside you're happy to be out there in a good mood a bit of peer pressure whatever else it may be and then suddenly you're taking things to the face up the ears you know or, or up the other bit into the ears and then suddenly you're getting absolutely banged out and it's not obviously the best way to go about things so i understand their need to try and push it forward but this is a bit ridiculous the review is also requested by the then house secretary Priti patel in september 2021 so pushing for a while it's believed that the for the formal announcement could be made as part of the government's anti-social behavior strategy which is set to be published in april what i love about the uk when it comes to these sort of things there's never any education there's never any opportunity to uh to kind of um tell people how they should be how they should be behaving when it comes to antisocial behavior it's always let's just ban the thing that's getting on our nerves let's not sit down with these people who we feel like are repeat offenders or who are the main culprits and maybe come to some sort of conclusion as to how we can make this right no 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 we're gonna ban it that's it we're gonna ban it which is ridiculous because the people that are being antisocial for the most part are just gonna continue doing it anyway no amount of banning is really going to change things for the long run going forward. So I always find that kind of approach very strange and bizarre. If anything, you'll be missed hearing that sound as you're coming out of a nightclub of tss, hear some dude saying two for five, two for ten, three for ten, whatever it may be, and trying to entice you on the prices as you leave the nightclub because you just finished all your gear and you want another bit of a buzz. Because that's the only time I bought stuff like that. If I've already got still some stuff left on me, I'd much rather take that home and finish the bit that I have left before I go to bed, as opposed to going out and trying to ingest another drug into my system. And also, I've always looked at laughing gas, especially doing it through balloons, the same way as doing like shisha and stuff. It's not really my vibe. It kind of like, you know, after a few pulls of that stuff in a restaurant or in a cafe or bar somewhere, it gets very boring very quickly. I know people love the, the buzz of the head high when it comes to shisha and stuff, cool. But for me, it gets boring really, really quickly. And I think the same thing applies for balloons. When you first do them, it's pretty cool and pretty fun. But after a while, just the thought of you standing there with a balloon and sucking on it and whatnot and trying to make it look somewhat hard or cool is so lame. I think everyone that stands around with it, unless you're under the age of 22, you look like a capital R redact, in my opinion anyway, in my opinion. But let's see if they push it through. Hopefully they don't because kids need whipping, uh, laughing gas, kids need laughing gas. Let's go and quickly move on to this story, um, courtesy of Hip Hop Clout World, which is an incredible name for a page. But everyone on social media or on my side of social media has been getting really, you know, agitated and flipping annoyed and shouting from the rooftops about this really innocuous story that I don't really think you know really needs our attention but this is courtesy of them and it says twitter reacts to dj mv this is one person from the breakfast club on power alongside charlemagne who said his wife is taking a 20 day girl trip vacation i said i've noticed it's 29 here but i think it's a typo it should be 20 days vacation so this is dj mv talking about it and i'm going to comment on it on the other side Oh, actually, I can't, innit? Because the flipping speaker thing is on. Bear me one sec while I put the speaker thing on. There we go. Let's play that one more time. For 20 days. So I've been packing the kids' lunch, and when I've been packing... Oh, do it again. ...the lunch, I've been seeing your comments saying, why you put so many snacks in the bag? Why donuts? Why pop -ums? Why uh, salami and daddy that don't know how to cook. So, of course, my wife is, uh, she went on a girl's trip. She's gone for 20 days. So I've been packing the kids' lunch. And when I've been packing the lunch, I've been seeing your comments saying, why you put so many snacks in the bag? Why donuts? Why pop -ums? Why uh, salami and cheese you a daddy that sandwich? don't know how to cook. So, of course so ob obviously, everyone's going crazy at the fact that he's letting, which is a really strange term 
when it comes to these type of things. Um, his wife go on a holiday with her girls for 29 days. I guess the only thing to kind of preface this story is with, and again, I'd know this only because I listened to The Breakfast Club and I was on it pretty much heavy when it was pretty popular at the time. Now I haven't watched it in many, many, many years. But what I do remember is that DJ Envy, the guy, went for a pretty public uh, cheating scandal where I think a few ladies came out and basically said that he was, play, you know, cheating on his lady and stepping out on his, on his lady and whatnot. And I guess because they've been together for a long time and they have loads of kids, it was a really big issue at the time. I think the wife was threatening to divorce him. And then DJ MV had to do what most guys do and put his pride to one side because he knew day to day he couldn't really live without her. And, you know, having to quote unquote start again is just not something is going to be ever going to factor into it and most guys as well when they do cheat especially at this level you're not usually cheating because you don't think your wife is good enough you're just doing it because you have the access to do it and the availability to do it it's basically a convenience thing which is pretty hard to take if you're a girl to hear a dude say that it's just a convenience thing and you didn't actually feel anything or it's not that deep not that serious it probably makes the situation worse which is why you don't say anything you don't try and explain yourself you just try and work to get it back to whatever level it was prior and hope to pray hope and pray that your partner forgives you anyway he did that he went on radio publicly declared his love for his wife said how much he was sorry and did it in a very public humiliating kind of quote-unquote way and then she she accepted and they got back together but it felt like ever since then the power balance especially in public has shifted and she's somehow um, you know become the person who's now quote-unquote wearing the trousers so a lot of people view it as maybe DJ Envy being a cuck being a simp and allowing his wife to do that and also some people are viewing it in a way of like he had no choice because of what he'd done to her she's kind of in a very subtle way getting her get back now by going on a girl's trip and for dudes that are really possessive and have a weird warped very um, circumstantial situational um you know double standards way of looking at the world like the, he's probably the dj may i imagine is the kind of guy who's like oh if i cheat a million times my wife has to take me back but if she sucks one guy's dick who isn't me then suddenly you know i, I can't have her anymore she's for the streets i kick her out i call all these names under the sun I, I think he's one of those kind of guys so those kind of guys usually do overcompensate on the other end when it comes to holding down or trying to help and rescue relationships that they have because they don't want them to go and it feels if they'll be alone or without it but for me personally I don't see the problem with this. I think this is the maybe the main reason why I have such an issue when it comes to relationships anyway because of the compromising side of it. And I mentioned it prior. I've noticed in my adult life and I've noticed in my kind of social outgoings and whatnot and the fact that I am in this situation now at my big age with a very little, if not, um, if not, a very little, if not, nothing friendship group. I've realized at this point in my life, I've did it on I've done it on purpose. I know it could be the other way around. People also saying, you know, you know, categorically, hey, I don't want to be your friend. That could also be a really big thing. I'm sure that is the case. But I think most of it has to do with the fact that I prioritize me. So I'm incredibly selfish. And because of that, I find it very difficult to compromise. I find it very difficult to meet people where they are and to kind of, you know give something to take something it's kind of doesn't really operate in my brain i just do what i want to do at all times which obviously isn't the best ingredient for somebody who's in a relationship especially with somebody that you love and that you care about because you have to kind of work as a team so the idea of me having to ask permission to go on any kind of holiday or trip whether it's one day three day four five twenty fifteen fifty sorry is ridiculous but it's also conscious of the fact that these guys are married they have kids they you know share a life together i think if i'm not mistaken the wife is like a stay-at-home mom he makes all the money and stuff so there's clearly a um adult relationship where they, they both take responsibility of two parts of a household that are incredibly important holding it down financially and of course looking after the kids and the home right and making sure that's all well and good so they come together as a married couple so that kind of works so in that case you have to kind of coordinate with your partner so that they know how to kind of you know manage the things with the kids and want like i said to preparing the lunches who's picking up who blah 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 but the people who are criticizing it are looking at her as if she's like some 19 year old hussy trying to fly out to go and hit some random bellboy in a hotel somewhere that's a little bit beneath her you would imagine if all intents and purposes and i'd also imagine she's also going on this trip with other women of her age 
or in the same similar position who have partners as well that they're going with. So it makes things complete. So they have partners too who are letting them go, quote unquote. It would be different if she maybe was going with all her friends who happen to be single and who are always very vocal and, you know, uh, boastful about all their flipping sexual conquests. Maybe as a dude, that'd be a bit difficult to take if your, fr if your lady or partner has one of these kind of people as friends. But I think in general, if you really are wanting a balanced, healthy relationship, especially in 2023 going forward, I feel like the way people are so warped and wrapped up in their own reality and they literally think they are the star of their own reality TV show, I think it's quite important to let people do them when they ask you to let them do them. I think it's really important because the fact that people would ask is actually a big deal. Um, to, it's instead of just assuming I can do what I want to do because that kind of, you know, can throw up some weird questions. But I think the fact that people just can ask and consider and talk about certain things is actually a big thing. And I think somebody's willing to kind of meet you where you're at and kind of ask for your permission or let you know what they want to do. That's probably someone you should be holding on to because they respect you enough to let you know in case you do feel weird about it. But in general, I think letting people do what they want is pretty much some pretty much the foundation i think of a good health relationship because what's the opposite you're going to tell us you can't go to a girl strip then all the girls go they start posting amazing pictures they come back with amazing reports and now your girl's going to be you know um hating you forever and ever for not letting her go on this once a lifetime trip where they happen to bump into flipping denzel washington or flipping Rih rihanna in barbados or somewhere you don't want to be that guy so let them go let them have fun let them enjoy themselves and go back that way and if it is a weird way to kind of curry or win back favor from your wife because you cheated then you have to do what you have to do especially if you decide you want to stay with the person if you want to stay with the person you have to do whatever it takes to rescue that relationship whatever it takes and if it means having to put your pride and your nuts to one side and let her go on a holiday knowing full well that she may accidentally fall on top of the bellboy or blow somebody from the kitchen somewhere you just have to take that l in it it just is part of the game you have to take but the idea that he's a simp or a cuck for it the idea he has to let and she's some somehow kind of like his sis he's kind of like his wife's sister daughter thing is really bizarre and also just shows the nature of like you know relationships talk on social media it's all very possessiony based it's all very transactional you got the girls on one side saying yeah but my man has to pay my bills has to do has to do that and the other side you got guys saying oh if she slept with five people she might as well be a prostitute um i want my woman to do this want to do to do that it's very transactional very possession based there's not a lot of feelings emotions understanding personality conversation compatibility talk it's all just about you know what kind of comes first to mind when you see somebody and also how big their wallet is or how nice their car is which is obviously not the right way to go about things but i guess it is what it is in this situation moving on with that one we've got another story courtesy of no jumper featuring blueface and dj academics which i think is hilarious and to me is another indication or as another kind of validation of what I was saying prior. When I mentioned this podcast before, that I lost the fight in the most embarrassing way possible when I was in secondary school, and I'd been like 14 or 15, to the point where I was fighting somebody, and I was clearly losing, and he was getting the best of me, and I just ran, like it was after a football game, I just started running, and everyone was chasing me, they like, Tino, stop, where are you going? And I literally ran all the way back home, I think I must have been in like Wanstead Flats, and I ran all the way back home to where I used to live, like Custom House, Canning Town, which is a long distance, running, running with my flipping JD sports bag on my back, slapping my chest, slapping my back, sorry, and my whole entire shirt drenched in sweat and fear, all that stuff. And I remember... Um, the next day coming back to school feeling so embarrassed feeling so emasculated that I flipping ran away and bitched out on a fight like that and it got to a point where it was eating away at me so much that later on in life I decided to do martial arts I do a bit of boxing a bit of you know um, a bit of flipping uh, what's it called a little bit of kickboxing and whatnot so I had to watch a lot of UFC and then what happened and again I only realized it while doing the pod and explaining the situation is I started to realize I started to, I started to get into a lot of fights I'd get into a lot of fights outside, like especially when I used to go out loads of times around Dawson. I'd get in these random fights that no one would see. One time I actually got into a fight at the Alibi one time. I think it was actually friends of a friend of a friend who I don't really talk to too much now at the moment. But I remember he must have come through to the party with some friends of his who, if I imagine at the time, were boxers. 
like they were legit boxers like that went and did it for somewhat fun and somewhat amateur and they lit me up but I was still standing there swinging still going through going yeah come on come on like not moving like I didn't want to move I was basically a pinata all right they were just teeing off on me and I was swinging and missing like because I was drunk and high off flipping MDMA and drugs and whatnot but I just wanted to basically prove that I could stand there in the pocket and not get bitched out and then some other time also, again, so imagine all these fights I got in. Some other time, I remember getting into a fight after a, a night out again. I was crossing the road somewhere and this guy in a car, I think it might have been around Bethnal Green area. So some Asian dude in a car did something and I must have did the same, you know, the thing that everyone does when you're trying to be bad boy in the streets and try and fight people in cars. You punch it, you kick the flipping cars, it runs by it. So it must have either clip me or come close to clipping me and I kicked the door or something and the dude pulled over and said what the fuck did you do to my, my thing and then he came over to me and started talking and started, started shouting and I just bam decked him in the face and then we just started swinging we started fighting in the street just randomly just two men that didn't know each other two seconds ago we started getting into a full fight and I'm there in my full Dawson outfit skinny jeans Dr. Martin's on um, you know band t-shirt just like swinging at this guy with a bandana on probably and he's like just some asian dude wearing his flipping moss bros suit zara suit neck suit whatever he's doing on the way to finger bang his flipping lovely little desi missus right and we're in the street swinging fighting in the street i don't know who won if i remember correctly i think i might have dropped him what twice and he dropped me once i think so but again, dropping, I'm not sure if that counts in terms of fight, winning street fights. I feel like someone has to really submit and stop. I don't think just because someone drops you, you've lost. I know for me, I, I remember being in a fight where I beat this guy up in school and then he, man, he managed to punch me as he was falling over and it just clipped my nose in a way that my entire nose started pouring. It wasn't broken for some reason. So whatever blood vessel that was in there that was flipping inflamed just popped and my nose started bleeding. So when you walked outside and you didn't know what happened, I had my hand over my face covering and my face was bloody and that guy just looked like he'd been beaten up. So I looked like I lost, but I don't think I did. Anyway, <laughs> I remember getting into so many fights in the street, many in clubs in the street. Some I won, some I didn't, some I didn't, some I won, some I lost. But what I remember is I never ran again. So I had to kind of get my get back from how embarrassing and how bitch that I felt back in the day. So when I see DJ Academics, I can see somebody who is still feeling the embarrassment and the shame of being punked out by, who was that guy? Um, what's his name? The light-skinned dude on Everyday Struggle. He punked him out. I remember another time, who else did it? The whole Migos situation, when he was like nervously twitching with the microphone, when the Migos were going through that back and forth little thing with Joe Budden, and he said, let's end it. And they all stood up together, like flipping Power Rangers, and said, I'm buttoning their blouses, like they're going to raise a fight and whatnot. And obviously, for his career, so he has some other things, but those are the main things face to face that he's had where it's been proven that we've been able to see that academics is a bit of a P word, right? It's just is what it is. It's not a bad thing. I don't think everyone is put on this earth to be a fire or to be tough, but clearly he's not that guy. So because he's not that guy and he's covering a very, uh, you know, uh, machismo, alpha male type um, genre. In where a lot of people want to let their nuts hang, he's trying to reassert dominance and remind people, no, I'm a man also, and I'm also get you know ready to get down. But unfortunately for him, I feel like all this barking and shouting on the internet is never gonna get your get back. He needs to what academics needs to do, like I did, just get into fights with random people. He he needs to meet up with somebody, whether it's a little baby who's going back and forth. I think he's made up with Mick Mill, but his his recent opponents have been little baby. Little Zay Osama, he had some beef with recently. Um, who else he had some beef with? Beef with. I think that's it, right? And obviously Blueface. But he needs to meet some of these people up. Meet them up and just throw down. And hope and definitely record it. Put it up online. Even if he loses, he needs to be able to fight, not run, not do anything, and just, you know, scrap, get down with it, and keep it moving. So people know, okay, cool. Academics maybe can't fight. But at least he's ready to, to meet up and get down. And then maybe he can, you know, be able to kind of carry on without feeling this internal shame. Because I feel like this is what's coming through. And I feel like he made a very grave mistake by picking someone like Blueface. Because from what we've seen of Blueface, from the times he has been scrapping outside, and from the pictures of him fighting in the gym and boxing, and from him beating up, flipping Crayshon's dad and whatnot. Oh, no, was it his dad or Crayshon's dad? I don't know who that... Yeah, it must have been Crayshon's dad. I think so. In that Zeus series he's doing and just scrapping in general, he's down to scrap. I think Blueface has been in way more fights than probably 
you know, academics has had Happy Meals. Like, this guy has come from the gutter. He may be a bit of a joke now, and he may be a bit cringy and embarrassing things that he's doing, considering how talented musically he is. But let's not deny, the guy can definitely fight. So now it looks like academics doesn't want to fight Blueface, but wanting to fight everybody else that he thought he could get the win on. So it goes back to prove that, you know, he's suffering from this crisis identity. And I think it's absolutely hilarious. But anyway, he went through a back and forth with Blueface. This is courtesy of No Jumper. His dear academics response to Blueface after Blue called him out for a one-on-one -on -one fight. So Axe said to Blueface, I got 5k per nigga who fucked Blueface girl, Craig Sean, because I think Blueface said that Craig Sean, the, the girl that he's with, announced that she's pregnant. He said it's not his, that she was messing around with 10 other guys before, or 10 other guys while they were, to, they were together. So it's probably one of their guys. And obviously, Axe is now using that as a stick to beat him with, which is a bit strange, but hey, it is what it is. Um, if fuck Blueface girl who down to get on my Twitch stream breaking it down and how it happened, which is very messy, very sus. It continues DNA test included. Fuck Maury, big app for the do paternity test for that broke ass nigga Blueface. I'm pledging 50k for this effort. Who got Blueface girls pregnant? That's the that's the real top level cornery there, isn't it? 50k you're willing to spend to prove that Blueface's girl had sex with other men is very strange. We continue. It says 10 niggas piped down Blueface's girl and she's still taking Henny bottles to the head. Clown, get your manhood back before you talk to me. 10 niggas. And he wrote 1, 2, 3, 4, to 10. Um, uh, you nigger number 11. She got your kid. Answer that. Wow. Okay. He says Blueface said 10 niggas fucked his girl in the last year and she still dropped a video on him eating that nasty snatch. Own up to your responsibilities. You finna be on child support, Blueface. Get your manhood back from your girl which is funny because I think he needs to get his man back from Vic Mensa. So I think that's the guy I, was, I, was, I didn't remember. Vic Mensa punked him out. And um, he continues, fight the 10 niggas who piped your girl first and the girl who keeps beating your ass and I'm 100% down. MMA shit. So he wants Blueface to fight 10 people who he doesn't know for having sex relationship with his girl at the time, who knows, then he'll fight him. So like, what? How's that even make any sense? I'm going to buy your foreclosure house and kick you and your child and the mother of your child out. And the 10 niggas she done fucked. Okay, that's when you know you want to fight then, isn't it? When you start talking about the mother of your kids and stuff, that's like, okay, you need to relax. And of course, Blueface responded and said this following here. He said, um, we, all know, we all know when a nigga turning a fade down and Ak is clearly turning the beats um, the best down, the best way that he know how to. Ak want to get me to fight a female instead of him at 31 years of age. Give it up, bro. Squabble up or shut up which is definitely something I feel like most people should be doing. Less back and forth. So if you want to fight, get down. That's probably one reason why I was getting annoyed with Kanye too. Where he was going through his thing of like airing people out on Instagram and all that sort of nonsense. I was like, hold on. If I'm some of these people, like these Tremaines and them lot, who he was going out and making nicknames for and designing merch for, I would have just said, you know what? Like, let's just fight. But you saw what happened with Kanye when he started beefing with or squabbling with flipping Diddy online. He started do being, doing mad police shit. I'm going to call the police. If anything happens to me, it was Diddy. Blah, blah, blah. Like, no, no, no. You can't be talking all this smack talk, trying to antagonize me. I want to fight. And then suddenly now you're trying to call police and start to play like the victim. I hate that shit. No back and forth. Because men don't usually do that anyway. We're not really good at back and forth and engaging in that nonsense. It kind of is beneath us. Don't do the back and forth, chill, let's squabble up and meet up and get it out of the way and just continue on with our lives. The next slide, it says, um, nigga said MMA, he must want to wrestle or some, LOL, because Ak for sure can't throw no kicks with his fat ass. The jokes, niggas always use the bitch ass cop out to sound like bitch ass nigga to me. It continued, Ak was in a committed relationship with Selena Powell, very true. Come on, cuz, you really want to talk about a bitch, bro? Ak is offering 5k to 10 niggas to take the fade for him. I must be the big bad wolf or something, cuz he's so gangster for little baby. True. And I think Blueface even said, I'll take the fade for little baby. Like, little baby what way the fade. You didn't want it, or something didn't happen, and the commission broke down, but it didn't happen, and now he'll take it. And clearly, now, from what I last heard of Ak talking on his podcast, I think he mentioned it here, actually, on his pod. Let me play if I can see if I can play it. I think it mentions it here. Let's see if I can get it out loud so you can hear it here on this podcast. I've got my phone. Of course. Um, 1090s Jake, thank you to um, everybody who donated. Fuck. I should just shout you guys out, right? God damn. Somebody said, Act, you changed. 
let Jake slide on him snitching in 2012. What are you talking about in 2012? Coming up, it's coming up, it's coming up, it's coming up now. Let let Jake slide on him. Bear with me, bear with me, it's coming up, it's coming up, it's coming up. So I said, yo, you were down to fight baby for free, now it's five million from that. Baby's hot, my nigga. First of all, didn't I tell you I pick and choose? Nigga, when Meek was like one of the top rappers, nigga, I was down for that too. Bro, we're talking about an irrelevant nigga, bro. The irrelevant, you know I pulled up the stats? Irrelevancy. Nah, nah. I'm trying to see what I could gain from it. Nah. I'm sorry, my nigga. Nah. My job is creating content and doing all this shit. I'm oh, now nah, it's my job. With the name on the deed, nigga, just like scrapping with niggas in the alleyway for free. Especially a nigga who's fucking irrelevant. Boo. He was relevant enough to argue with back and forth. The moment he calls you out to fight, you don't want it. But personally, for me anyway, to end this whole segment, I feel like I can identify with Ak because I can, I know what that shame and that embarrassment of being regarded as a pussy can do to a man. But I got my lick back. I got my pride back by fighting random people in the street, like Asian dudes in cars who I cleaned. And again, I was in the wrong for the situations. The fight I had in that bar in the other by one time with those two boxers that lit me up, I was in the wrong. I'm pretty sure. I spilled something on them. I didn't want to say sorry. I decided to act tough and decided to want to fight boxers and got lit up. I still fought there anyway. The stuff with the Asian guy in the car, I'm pretty sure I'm the one that crossed without looking. He beeped like, hey, re- relax, watch where you're going. I kicked his car, which I shouldn't have done. And then we started, and then he got in my face and I punched him straight away. He started squabbling. I was in the wrong. And any number of fights outside of that. I'm sure I started it. I'm the instigator. But I had to get my lick back. As a man, I had to. And if some dad had to suffer, and now he's sitting at home with a brain hemorrhage, wondering why this random black guy had a fight with him in the middle of a Morrison's, I'm sorry, but I had to get my get back. I had to get it back. And I think every man goes through that. But I think you have to go and get it back instead of barking and woofing all over the flipping internet. It just doesn't work, in my opinion. Even if you lose, it doesn't matter if you win or lose in these situations because you can't win or lose. You just have to be, you just have to be willing to go through the pain of being in a fight, you know, having the possibility of you losing and getting your ass kicked, but also knowing well in yourself that, you know what? I did my best. You know, I kind of got, I kind of got my get back. I set things right with me personally in terms of pride. And now I'm in a position where I can go forward with life. I can continue on. I can look forward to things. I can be happy again. <laughs> the sun is shining bright now. I can enjoy the cold breeze upon my face because I know I got my get back because I know I got my get back. Anyway, continuing on quickly, we're going to move on. Topic here regarding Maiden Voyage Festival that's happening on the 27th. Bank holiday Sunday this month. I'm oh, sorry, in August. Sorry, 27th of August, bank holiday. And I'm really interested in it because this is one of those one day festival things that's become all the rage here in the UK. I'm not too sure if this is a because it's easier to get a license for these sort of things because it does feel like one of those kind of licensing hacks because it's a one day event under a certain amount of time. You can maybe not have to get certain bits of insurance that would make it a little bit more less worthwhile so you can put these other events together that are a little bit more temporary a little bit more ad hoc a little bit more diy in style but with still the same kind of ethos of a festival but regardless i kind of like what they're doing and i really like the fact that it's a one-day festival the prices are really decent right for one day festival it goes anywhere between 20 pounds to 80 pounds so the first release entry before 3 p.m which is a crazy time before to go to a festival it goes from 12 to 10 p.m which is no real time either but to leave your house before flipping 3 p.m to go to a festival is absolutely wild i've done it before and went to primavera of course but i can't imagine going that early to a festival in the uk it is what it is but anywhere between 20 to 80 pounds depending on when you want to go and the lineup is pretty decent you got Ace Mo, DJ Boring, Cass Dead, Cass is Dead, sorry, C Frim, DJ EZ, who for me would be the biggest pick to choose from a lineup like that going to a day festival in the UK, especially in London. He will tear that thing to absolute smithereens. Smithereens. You got Fellow T, you got Harren Sauna at Double XL, which includes everybody from that Harren Sauna crew, if I'm not if I'm not mistaken. And they're obviously an amazing collective to come and play at these type of events. I think if you've seen them, there might be a video if I'm pretty sure there's a video of them playing. I'm gonna say, is it is it boiler room? Is it a boiler room event? Let me see if I can quickly check this out on my YouTube here on my phone. I think it might be a boiler room. They do a particular event over there and it's pretty decent. Um 
Where is it? Let's see if I can see it. They've got okay. They've got one. They've got a, they've got one on the hall. They've got one on, on boiler room. They've got another boiler room. But is it together as a group? Let me see if I can find that double XL. It says here, right? Let's see if they've got one together. Double XL Heron sauna. Maybe it's deck mantle then. Is it deck mantle? Okay, yes, yeah, deck mantle. It's it closing set deck mantle. So I think Heron sauna double XL. If I'm not mistaken, it is the MCM LXXXV guy and the other guy too. I forgot his name. Who's part of it? Uh, maybe SPF DJ also. She might be included. I'm not too sure. Hector Oaks might be included also. Who else is in it? Oh, where is she? Someone else is there. That's part of it. Oh, and Sem. So yeah, so it's probably them going together. So it's probably MCM, LXXV. It's Sem, SPF DJ, and maybe someone else included there. Let me just play this video courtesy of somebody from Deck Mantle Festival. Let's see what they're saying. It's just the sound playing here. Bear with me a sec while I fast forward a little bit. Yeah, from what I can see here, looking at the picture of the people behind the booth, it does look like there's four of them. So SPF DJ, I'm assuming, Sem, MCM, and um, what's his name? Uh, the guy that fucking taps his feet all the time, looking like a little bit of a cathead. Uh, Hector Oaks. Those guys are playing. So that'd be pretty cool. Carrying on, we've got Hiroko y Yamamura. That'd be awesome too. I think she played a really cool set on Boiler Room recently. Everyone was going crazy for us. So check that out. Interplanetary Criminal. Job Jose was always good at these type of events. Jules. Jotty, who everyone's going... Yotti, sorry, who everyone's going crazy for. Not really for me. Logic 1000, everyone loves. Moxie, everyone loves. Again, a bit boring for me. A bit too nts -y. Um, Nicola Cruz. Noira. Richie Horton. Yes, the legend that'd be great to see in that kind of environment again just kind of to throw up interesting people right ez heron sauna um double xl dj boring maybe cast is dead will be a good one i said already richie horton i think will be good in that sort of venue um so chitarada was probably be good dj sprinkles more so than spf dj or vtss to be honest you see them every single weekend it feels like um at every single venue especially i think vts lives here now isn't it because she's on every single venue lineup, man. It's a little bit little bit overkill for me personally. Don't know how much of that stuff can you listen to on a weekly basis, but people like it. But if it was me, I'd prefer to see Sprinkles anyway over those lot. But regardless, it's great. And then the other thing that's awesome, they've got these other stage hosts as well that are taking part. They've got 999 Ginger, Hall Berlin, Phonox, and Unfold. Unfold are going to be curating a stage i guess or a lineup at this day festival which is pretty sick so i don't know how they're going to fit everybody else in for a festival that goes between 12 to 3 sorry um 12 to 10 p.m i'm assuming they're going to have many different stages or sections of the festival so where's it taking place lee valley showground i've never been there before in my entire life but i'm anxious to see how that goes down but i like the lineup i like the lineup i like what they're doing here i like that it's 20 pound to 80 pounds so it's very very affordable i like everything around it um, let me see if they've got an after movie here to check out what it looks like because I'm really curious to see what the vibe is like at these sort of festivals. We've got some pictures here that can give us a bit of a vibe. Let's play this. <laughs> okay. I think that video features I Jordan, if I'm not mistaken. Is that I Jordan playing there? I think so. Is it I Jordan? I'm not too sure, but. <laughs> Looks pretty cool. It looks like a. It kind of reminds you of Awakening. It's got like an. It's an outdoor venue, but there's loads of like roofed, um, you know, enclosed spaces with loads of open, um, sides and stuff. So the lights pouring through, but it's still kind of hazy and whatnot. So that's quite nice. And if you're a bit of a smoker, you can also enjoy yourself in these kind of venues. So that's pretty cool. That was fun. A lot of girls with armpit hair. Nice continue there nice pictures of people it kind of reminds me a little bit of ava in terms of the vibe and the people that are there in it it kind of looks a little bit like that but it looks kind of fun nice fun people there loads of cool looking people looks like they've got a fun fair also there and um, loads of nice attract att attractions you've got another video here featuring uh, vtss and somebody else there and behind the booth laughing and joking smiling having a good time Ooh, that looks like a vibe. I might have to go, actually. I think I might have to get my ticket arranged. Nice range of people also. I think that's a, one of the killer things about UK festivals that really help or make it or break it when it comes to the range of people. Does it cover a broad range of people? Or is this the same old regurgitated hipstery faces that go to all the same events? I want it to be a nice variety of ages, a nice variety of backgrounds, of colours and creeds, social standings and 
education levels and um, IQs and whatnot. That's what I want. I want it to be nice and varied. I don't want it to be all the same diff- the same people wearing the same double sole Dr. Martins. Please, thank you. Okay, that, that looks fun. That looks fun. Another picture here of some people here, some nondescript black people hanging out, having good times. You know, reminding people where the music actually came from. <laughs> hey, we invented this stuff, man. Okay, cool. Congrats. Have a drink on me. <laughs> we continue more pictures of people outside having fun. Yeah, it looks quite fun. It looks quite sick, to be fair. It looks absolutely banging and full. To be fair, off the strength of just the pictures. Again, I haven't been. I don't know what the sound is saying. It could be horrible. But this looks like a way better time or way better use of your resources than going to flipping field day. This looks absolutely incredible. <laughs> Man, that Euro Trash hard dance stuff is so hard to get into. The lack of groove, the lack of bounce, the lack of vibes, the lack of quality. And maybe it's because I'm from here and I've listened to that stuff like since I was like, what, 13 or whatnot on random music video channels back in the day when I didn't really know what electronic music or dance music was. You heard that shit playing all the time. And then once you get older and you start getting into the scene and you start to like stuff, it's hard for me to become like retroactively into this stuff when I didn't like it before. Like I remember being into um, the Smiths early on because i was like i love skateboarding i remember being into my buddy valentine and all that sort of stuff because i like that kind of music not because suddenly when i became older it became cool i tried to basically retroactively go back into my archive into my memory back into my history books to try and like these things myself look cool if i didn't like it back then i'm not gonna like it now so this sort of like hard dance hard trance sort of stuff is just not for me in the slightest man it's so i don't know cliche corny yuck um, another cool picture of people again. Who is this DJ with the hands in there? That's Jada G. Having a good time to in front of a... <laughs> this looks like they could be good. Yeah, so when I see olive green... And I see kind of those kind of muted colours. I think of geography teachers. And I think of Gerd Janssen. I'm pretty sure it isn't him. Uh, but it does look like it could be him. Who is it? If I click that. Okay, someone called Young Sing. <laughs> Yeah, this stuff in the festival is going to go off, in it, right? This kind of uh, Desi, Bollywood-inspired flipping garage music and whatnot. People are going to go absolutely crazy for it, right? Um, this is like um, South Pacific or what, um, Southeast Asian. or it, how, do, how do you call people that from that region of the earth? I'd say, do you say Indian or South Asian? South Asian-tinged um, garage music is going to go off, especially considering their history with garage music, right? They were right there with us blacks, you know, spear spearheading this music. I remember back in the day, actually, a very prominent member when I used to listen to Flipping Pirate Radio, one of the biggest guys back in the day that used to play garage Oh no, he used to play like R&B on like Deja. Or was it Deja? Was it Deja Vu? He used to play on there and everyone found out he was Asian. He sounded black. He sounded like some light-skinned guy with green eyes and everyone found out he was some Asian dude. Um, which kind of, you know, was a bit of a anti-climax for some girls, but I guess some girls are still turned on by him and he used to absolutely clean up the phone calls you'd get in with flipping women and mums and stuff, you know, throwing their snatch at him was absolutely funny. I forgot the guy's name. It wasn't entertainment crew. Somebody else or some other guy that used to play like R&B and sometimes garage and that kind of stuff. Like really cool beats. I, f- I wonder if he's still around nowadays. I forgot his name. But anyway, that's just to say the history of Asian people and garage and grind from back in the day alongside the blacks and the Africans and the Caribbeans is very strong. So I'm very for this type, especially if they tinge it and they kind of sprinkle some of their own traditional type music into it. It's going to sound nuts, bro. Uh, in Under the UK sun, are you dumb? In London somewhere with a bit of kizzy up your nose, a little bit of a pinger in your system, right? Come on, son. <laughs> 
wheel up. See, you're not going to get cancelled wheeling up here. No one's going to cancel you. You're not going to get a flipping op-ed written on flipping RA, Mix Mag or DJ Mag talking about how you are re-establishing gender norms and you are part of the patriarchy and stuff. If you rewind here, people get it. They get it, man. They understand. They know the vibes. So big up Maiden Voyage. I'm going to be there. This looks already fun. You sold it to me. These are these after movie things. As much as they're a little bit corny and cringy, they're really important to get the vibes so that you can go so if you haven't already seen it definitely go check it out that's the instagram page there it's maiden voyage festival all one word it's going to be happening on bank holiday sunday the 27th of august 2023 and look at the ticket prices brother look at the ticket prices absolutely bargain in this type of economy that we're in at the moment even if you end up taking the flipping second release the vip entry anytime is beautiful i'm not too sure what a vip entry means at a festival like this a day festival in flipping eden eden en9 i don't know what that actually means whether or not you get like a little golf cart that takes you next to the stage whether you get like a nicer uh, a toilet that has flipping cow shed you know um hand wash or something in it whether it's a bar that has drinks in the fridge instead of out in the open so they're actually chilled i'm not too sure but regardless to pay anywhere between 20 pounds to 80 60 pounds sorry plus booking fee is a bargain the fact that the booking fee goes up in increments is a little bit nasty right it's a little bit scumbaggery that the booking fee goes up like for the first release the booking fee is two pound forty sorry and then for, when you go to the final release the booking fee is six pounds which is strange it seems like well, it's like 10 percent of each thing or maybe it's a bit more but anyway who cares regardless i think it's still good value for money maiden voyage festival sunday 27th of august 2023 go there and check it out if you haven't already and i'm i think actually these day festival things might be a new vibe it might actually be a new way to kind of push things forward especially in the uk with all these restrictions that we have going on maybe a good way to kind of get around it is to have these type of things going forward next we're going to mention this because i feel like i need to mention this and get us off my chest am i the only person that gets a little bit annoyed when frank ocean does stuff like this this is courtesy of the instagram sorry the twitter account called kuraku and it says here frank ocean seems to confirm a new album is on his way and they posted an excerpt from i guess a blonded poster that came with a vinyl i think that got re-released recently and there's like a kind of you know word salad press release thing on the inside of it and one part of this little word salad says the recording artist has since changed his mind about singles model and is again interested in more durational bodies of work so it just sounds like something that you read on the bottom of a piece of artwork at the Whitechapel gallery that's meant to make a banana that's stuck onto a piece of wall look like it's something more interesting or more in-depth or intellectual than the banana stuck onto the wall with a bit of duct tape it's annoying I just think these artists who kind of go out their way not to talk to flipping fans, the Beyonce's, the Rihanna's, the Frank Ocean's, even the Adele's to some extent, I think it's annoying. After a certain point, I know you don't want to do the whole press thing and be involved in the rumors and who you're dating and why do you do this, why do you do that, I get it. But your fans deserve some level of communication. And I feel like in these days, in these times, when people have the access to like smartphones and whatnot, and you could just turn on your Instagram stories or your Instagram and go live, or you can tweet something on Twitter, of course. You can write a blog post, whatever it may be. You can start a YouTube channel or make a curated or put together a YouTube video to announce some things. There's no excuse not to keep your fans abreast and up to date on what you're going to do stuff. Now, I'd much rather you don't say anything then say these coded messages and kind of feed them through some sort of weird thing. Like you have to buy the vinyl to understand and find out what's going on. And this vinyl thing as well, he's acting like he didn't write it himself. It's like written in third person. The recording artist has since changed his mind. It's like, come on, man, do yourself a favor. Stop being so pretentious and up your own ass. If you want to make music, do it. If you don't, don't. But I understand why he's in the position, right? Homer, the jury line that he's kind of currently doing or the jury um, workshop, or whatever he's currently pushing is clearly doing great. He's clearly enjoying himself and having a great time with that. And I'd imagine, you know, regardless of how talented and creative and excellent he is at creating music, it is maybe a little bit exhausting and maybe he's kind of run out of motivation to it because you have to imagine as well, Frank Ocean's had a very long career in the industry. He was, you know, I forgot his name beforehand, but he had a very long career before he decided to go under the pseudonym of Frank Ocean and all throughout that time do things behind the scenes. So maybe he's a bit burnt out. Maybe he needed Homer to kind of reinvigorate him and relight his creative fire. And now he's in a place where he can feed that creativity back into music. Cool. But just talk to us when you're ready. 
don't give us these drips and drabs of information and it's not coming directly through you it's coming through some third party thing or whatever it may be or this other source it's annoying just speak to the fans just tell them what your plan is, what you got going forward, or just drop and keep it moving. But this whole kind of like little bit something, nothing kind of approach, it really grinds my gears. I'm not going to lie. It kind of is annoying. And again, I'm a little bit biased in the situation because I'm one of the flipping Redax who decided to go to Primavera Festival that one year that he said he was going to headline and then he didn't turn up and he kind of cancelled the week before. I was one of those guys that bought a ticket partly assuming and hoping he'd be there then he wasn't. So I can only have myself to blame. But come on, Giza, man. Come on. Don't be like that. Do you know what I mean? Talk to your fans. Communicate with your fans. Let them know Wagwan. And then we can decide what we want to do for their going forward. But I also understand he's under no obligation to talk to us or to let us know anything. Whenever he's ready to do anything he wants to do, he can let us know. And we have to kind of just, you know, put up or shut up. And that's just the situation that we're in at the moment. That's just the situation we're in at the moment. But I do would wish he would communicate with us a little bit more and kind of give us some indication as to what he's actually going to do. But, you know... That's probably wishing on a star. That's probably wishing on a star. Next, I wanted to mention this as well. This is courtesy of Hypebeast regarding these Pharrell human race dip, the NMD S1s in beige and blue canvas. Am I the only person that kind of likes these? They're essentially like a, what you'd imagine the old NMDs are, but they've kind of been max, maximalized, right? They've kind of been max, maxed out. They've been um, uh, added, bulked up and whatnot. They remind me a little bit of those boots that he put out a while ago, but essentially it's kind of like an NMD type shoe with a sock type upper with a really thick sole here that kind of goes down to a point in the front and with these nice little extra bits that poke out here on the side that I'm sure have some sort of practical um, you know, uh, feature in it where maybe they're meant to adjust or stabilize your feet as you're walking. And then they've got the human race um, text kind of sprayed across the front of it. So in effect, it kind of looks like Pharrell's version of a 350 of what they did with Yeezys and whatnot. But I do like the look of them, I'm not going to tell, especially if they would come in and more maybe more of a darker colorway i do think they look pretty handy to me personally but i'm not really too sure what people's you know motivation is nowadays to be wearing frail design sneakers it kind of feels like that moment might have passed but it continues it says the duo's long lasting partnership continues to push out reimagined kicks every year recently dropping the football inspired human race samba collection for us human race line is now setting its sights on an nmd s1 seen on williams himself in a billion dollar boys club and new york yankees launched in august the sneaker has now received official imagery and is set to hit retails very soon i wonder if that was always the point because I think Human Race is also the name of his skincare line, right? If I'm not mistaken. I wonder if that was always the, the plan to separate Pharrell, the person, from these brands so that he could maybe take a step back or maybe let his stuff breathe without having an association of his name. Because, you know, maybe your name is a bit Marmite. Maybe some people like you. Maybe some people don't want to endorse you. Don't agree with certain things. So if you step back and you create a brand that you can represent, it kind of allows there to be some separation from it a little bit. I wonder if that's the case. I'm not really too sure. But I'm just interested in kind of figuring it out loud. It continues. Says, the fairly new model geared towards a lifestyle market is now given a striking makeover while the similar build to the original is maintained throughout. Um, titled Moobus, the clean cut model. Okay, that's what it's called. It's called the Moobs, the Maubs. M-A-U-B. The clean cut model is presented in a dominant beige palette with the rears as asymmetrical dipped in cobalt blue and off-white uh, balance rope laces sit atop the knitted uppers. The only thing I'd say is maybe if I was ha having a design tip or extra to add on there, I'd maybe get rid of the laces. I think the laces don't really serve them too well. I don't like how the text kind of bends around the front here. It's really strange. Maybe they couldn't print on this bit here because there's a little bit of a toe cap thing underneath the front here. But I don't like how the text from the side bends across and tries to poke in front of the toe because it looks like it's been done kind of haphazardly. If you're going to bend them around, the, the letters, bend it around properly like how they, did, how they used to do the Nike swooshes on the front of the football boots. Just bend it around it, but don't place it and it kind of warps around. It looks a bit strange in my opinion personally. The other thing I'd say is that the laces aren't really needed in this shoe i think there's a way to design this upper without actually having laces on it personally for me um i don't know if this is hemp material looking at it from the zoomed in or if it's kind of like a brushed canvas sort of type material but i do like the ability to be able to get some level of consistency in colors from this cobalt blue which is one of my favorite blues i've got so many jackets and coats that are this cobalt blue so and i think it's actually a color that i maybe fell in love with because of junior watanabe because there was a period in time where junior was making loads of stuff in that kind of cobalt blue type color but anyway regardless 
I like that how they've been able to somehow get a consistency in this cobalt blue to hit this PU rubber. I don't know what this stuff is in the midsole color and also the upper, whether this hemp material is or canvas. There's some, you know, quality standard issues here around it where the line isn't as crisp as you'd want it to be for a shoe that you're going to pay $150 for. But I do like in terms of color grading and, you know, tonality and whatnot. They've been able to get some level of consistency between this main midsole and the upper and this back heel tab bit that looks a little bit like a different material also. So yeah, I would I like I'll give them props for doing that. But the laces I think are a little bit unnecessary. This warped little way of having human race written on the shoe is a little bit redacted, in my opinion. It, it looks especially bad towards the front here. See? When you when you look at it towards the front with a bit poking out, especially when you look at it towards the down looking that it looks like a bad imitation of a Yeezy like you took a Yeezy and kind of just writ on top of it in my opinion but I'm not really that big of a fan of them but I do like the fact that he's offering something a little bit more interesting and different to me personally I think the boot design he did for that model I'm not sure if they got it here underneath for the of the text but whatever that boot design model was on that shoe that was far better yeah this black type of colorway here the SMDS one, I think there's a core, this is from last year, right? A core black and alt blue colorway is really nice. And they've also got that boot model where they had some really cool pictures showing how it looked. And I thought that looked really cool. There was like a model that was kind of like a, a boot, like a boot that came up to the middle of your shin or something like that. And I thought that looked pretty high. That looked pretty cool. But the lows, I'm not really too fond of a fan of. I don't think the, the laces work. And I hate the text that's going around the front, in my personal opinion. But it looks like his version, looking at it from the human race, it looks like he's removed the stripes because it looks like if you look at this um black version that i've got here on the screen it's the same model but essentially on the sides they've added some like a panel with stripes on it but on his one's for else version there is no stripes on it at all okay these are the okay these are the same shoes he wore when he did the batting thing i guess right this picture is from i think this is for his legs i can tell from how skinny and unathletic they are because he always jumps on private planes he's for private planes are for fixed gear bike in it that's what he does that's how that's how rich influential is in, in culture but yeah um, i remember he did some sort of throw some sort of first pitch thing at some baseball stadium and i remember seeing a picture of him wearing these so these i guess are the same ones so they look pretty cool very thick very maximalist looking in terms of the outlook but i'm not a fan of the the text um the materials the laces on the front i think are necessary but that's just me that is just me what else we have here quickly going to go and talk about I was talking about these also. I really like these more so than I thought I would, but I just don't like when you take out the shoe inside. And I'm talking about the Nike and Clock design Cortezes. They've designed them in this really interesting way. I feel like I've seen a lot more of these designs of these kind of like um, shoe protector, these shoe rain jacket type things that are really awful. I feel like I feel like they're the kind of thing that only white people and Asian people would wear. It's kind of weird you know um it's kind of like earmuffs who else you see wearing earmuffs you see white guys and you see asian people that love earmuffs right my ears are cold i need to have specific things to cover just my ears they're not doing like the rest of us and putting a collar up or put your hat over your ears or just toughing it out they need particular things so i feel like these little kind of shoe jackets or shoe duffel bags or like little things they're kind of things that you would expect those people from those communities to wear and you know thinking that this is a club collaboration makes a lot of sense but I still like the fact that it's a Cortez. So if you're not looking at it, it's just a what you what you imagine a regular Nike Cortez is. But essentially, the half of the Cortez is made up of this kind of weird neoprene type fabric with a drawstring at the top. It kind of reminds me a little bit of an Air Mock as well. A little bit. Remember the Air Mocks? They were kind of like this potato type inspired looking shoe that was an ACG shoe that you could kind of slip your foot in and out of. And that was people used it for hiking and for you know being in the water and whatnot and it was made out of really cool breathable materials and just easy to wear i remember having a few pairs of them i used to wear myself personally and it kind of reminds you of that because i remember on those ones they didn't have a there's no lace system just kind of slip your foot in but on some they have like a little string that you kind of pull on the back to kind of make the sock section a bit tighter and to kind of stop things from going into your foot if you need be so they've got that whole thing going on i also like the fact that the, the contrasting stitch i'm sorry contrasting colors on the swoosh here that little detail is very nice so on the neoprene side there's like a white half swoosh and on the shoe on the inside there's a black swoosh so when you wear them together you've got a half white half black swoosh there that's very nice maybe it's a yin yang type of thing i'm assuming 
Um, continuing on, you got another picture here showing the upper of the Cortez and then the bottom of it. It felt like there was a real effort to bring the Cortez back, but it didn't feel like Nike really pressed the button. I feel like there was that one from Union and a few others, but it didn't feel like they really pressed the button to go, okay, let's turn this thing on. Had they even collaborated with YG? I'm just thinking about it just out loud. Had they collaborated with YG? I thought YG would be an excellent person to collaborate on Nike Cortez with, considering his history and considering what he does with his own brand of those flipping, um, what you call it, of, of those bootleg Cortez that he put out. I thought that would be a good person to kind of promote them. Or maybe even Kendrick Lamar. He's seen wearing them a few times. But anyway, regardless, um, they seemed like there was a moment they were trying to bring them back, but they didn't really go forward with it. Maybe because of the success of the dunk, they put the Cortez stuff back a little bit. But I thought there was going to be a Cortez moment where they were trying to try and full cross, full court press, make the Cortez thing happen. But I don't think they can because I just think in general, it's a, such a Marmite shoe. Even though it's one of Nike's older models out there on the market right now, it's still a model that people just don't really get behind too tough. I don't really sure why personally because I do think they're probably the least, least offensive shoe out there. But it is what it is. It continues here. We've got another picture here showing the two shoes from the top down the lacing again the lacing man i don't know why people lace their shoes like this when you're doing i know like this is a leak and it's not an official picture image or whatnot but the lacing that comes out from the factories is just terrible isn't it so garbage we continue again here another picture showing the draw show yes it is a yin yang thing showing the pull tab there where you kind of you know secure the shoe on the top and then you've got another shoe option showing the shoe as it popped out of the sock so whatever sock okay so you can wear it three ways i'm assuming or two ways sorry you can wear it on the left like that really thin it kind of reminds me of a lonsdale so i'm not really a fan of that that kind of really thin boxing shoe type of thing and then you've got also this kind of uh ballet shoe so essentially like a nike pump so you're gonna see guys walking around looking like you know lolitas or thinking in their head they look like samurais, but they actually look like Lolitas. And then you've got another model here also that's got another shoe with no real fastening. I'm not sure how you meant to wear that bit, but it's basically like an insole with a heel cup on the back. I'm not too sure how that works out. But regardless, it's like a three-in-one type of shoe, type of vibe. And yeah, the bottom of the soles look interesting. You've got the clot design there on the bottom there. And then, of course, on the other shoe, you've got the boxing-type tire tread overs there as well. And then you've got the signs there on the back of each shoe also going on it. And then obviously you got some. Okay, so it's a Tai Chi. You meant to be a Tai Chi thing. So I guess you meant to take the bottom shoe off to do Tai Chi in the park. And then you meant to take the other one on to work out. And I think it says, well, it spells letters, right? It says K E O T, Kiot. So it looks like it's got these illustrations of people doing Tai Chi on the inside of the box. So I'm assuming there's some sort of Tai Chi crossover with these. It kind of reminds me of Acronym, when Acronym were getting into doing UFC, MMA, Jiu Jitsu stuff, because I think the founder is balls deep into MMA, Jiu Jitsu, Muay Thai, or something along those kind of lines. And they had people wearing the flipping Acronym, doing flipping kicks and stuff, and spinning kicks. And it's so cringe. Personally, for me, I think all that stuff is super cringe. When they start designing like Jiu Jitsu merch or like fighting gear, it's up there with designing merch for like Lamborghinis where you don't drive one. Like most of your customers can't afford a lamborghini but here you are making flipping mercedes and lamborghini merch like on porsche merch it's like come on man relax all this fighting merch as well it's like no none of you guys are fighting most of you guys are flipping you know ordering you know 33 door dashes per day and whatnot um going to flipping influencer marketing meetings hanging out at paris fashion week in showrooms you're not fighting anybody so it's a little bit redacted in my personal opinion and of course they've got a beer brick also matching with that's gonna be going for money next to a uh is that bobby hundreds no the hundreds adam bomb thing is adam bomb flipping trendy now i remember when adam bomb logo came about that was that was when i kind of jumped off of hundreds i think hundreds got really corny as soon as they started incorporating the adam bomb top type logo because if i remember correctly he designed it and asked people to name name it and you had to you know it was a competition type vibe which is like oh, i can't do this man they've got a fucking mascot for the brand but again this was successful still doing their thing so big up bobby big up ben hundreds over there doing their thing but yeah, these clutch shoes are interesting. Not personally for me, because um, like I said, that inside shoe, it looks like a Lonsdale, um, you know, anti, you know, Asbo type shoe. The kind of thing that I remember people in my area who didn't like black people would wear and chase you down the street for. And they're meant to be coming out in spring 2023. They're priced $150. So not too much money is there. So pretty much a bit of a bargain if you're into it. But for me, 
No mass. For me, absolutely no mass. I cannot see myself wearing these in the slightest. They look absolutely horrible, personally. But again, you know, who am I to judge when it comes to these things? Who am I to judge? And then we also got this, which I'm quickly going to feature towards the end here. This is courtesy of Hype Beast regarding the Brain Dead in Essex Jail Nimbus 9. And again, we have to give props to Brain Dead for always doing very interesting collaborations, always approaching things in a very unique and interesting and creative way, always going for brand partners and footwear that aren't maybe the most, you know, front there, out there, coolest things, but also trying to get their ideas out there regardless. And I feel like this is a good example of it. This gel like Nimbus reminds me, I think Nimbus is the site, is the name they have on Dragon Ball Z for the cloud, isn't it, right? Is it Nimbus? That uh, Goku jumps on and rides and stuff. I think that's it, right? Nimbus, I'm pretty sure. Uh, but these look pretty nice. Gel Nimbuses, they'll tell me two colorways. Ooh. So they've got the first colorway that's maybe more of my vibe. It was a combination of like, it looks like oranges, reds, Tiffany, like light blues, purples, greens right a very kind of saf hot safari type colorway and then you've got another colorway that's maybe a bit more traditionally sneakerish they've got a lot of purples a lot of dark greens a lot of neon greens you've got this nice pink hit on the bottom of the sole that kind of looks a bit like gum that's really interesting little ad ad um, addition here at the bottom of the sole so where you'd see maybe gum or something maybe translucent or maybe a clear sole to kind of give it some pop they added this kind of off-white, this kind of washed out pink type vibe to the bottom of them. And it looked really, really nice. I like these. I'm not going to lie. Uh, it continues here. It says, following an early preview of the green, yellow, red pair, Brendan has officially announced the launch of his Asex Nimbus collaboration, starring an unseen purple and green colorway. The two also launched in Paris Fashion Week on January 21st, with wider release coming in January 24th. So they're already out now already. So I'm pretty sure they're probably sold out. But I do like both colorways. I think they look absolutely incredible. Let's see if they're actually available to actually purchase to see how much price they are because I think these are really nice. But again, because they're not flipping Jordan 1s or they're not Salomons and stuff, people aren't going to care. But I feel like these aspects are really, really well done personally for me. Um, I like them. I really, really do. Let's click shop here. Asics Brain Dead. Let's see what they say about these assets and see if they're available to actually purchase via the Brain With Dead site, which I really like to navigate and browse on. I think it's very well put together. We've got the two colors. Let's go for the purple and green and see what sizes are available. And I'm pretty sure what you'll see here is that most sizes are available because most kids are sheep and they just buy the cool shoe that's available, as you can see there. Most sizes from 6 to 11 are available. The only ones sold out are sizes, what, 6, regular, 7, 8, nine and eleven everything else is available so you can get most sizes of size up or down and you're pretty much set but they do look absolutely fantastic price wise only 140 dollars i think pretty oh, sorry 140, 140 pounds i think it's a pretty good deal for a limited edition shoe that you're not going to see many people out there wearing i'm pretty much a big fan of it i love the purple and green colorway because i like that hit of that neon green on the front of the laces i'm a sucker for a bit of neon green and again i think that pink addition on the outsole is very clever because it kind of is another cool, interesting way of doing the gum without having gum. I really like that idea. Um, yeah, I like the purple and green. I think it reminds me a little bit of a Foot Patrol stab from back in the day. Maybe that's why I like it so much. Um, it looks like a rope lace. So from the top here, the colors are a bit washed out. I love the difference in terms of the materials. You've got some mesh, you've got some suede, you've got some leather. That's always beautiful. Again, nice addition focus there on the outsole. With a little pink or purple hit there very 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 well done for me personally and of course the other colorway which everybody's probably hyped on which is the one that is what they say they said it's a rio rust and almost apricot okay i like that color always apricot so both colors are pretty decent i obviously love both and it looks like from the sizing available it looks like the purple and green ones are way more popular because they've got way more of a full size run in the apricot colorway but I do like both colors regardless. But again, these aren't sold out. They're not reselling for any big amounts of money. So they're not going to be ones you buy for a check or anything. Oh, I love the idea. Oh, they've got a little integration of the Brain Dead logo here on the, on the tongue. I love that. I'm a big sucker for that now. I feel like because collaborations are so plentiful and because brands know how much value they can add to 
you know, because they know how, you know, valuable the Black Irish could be for either party, I feel like they're more willing to give people more things, like, you know, let people design a, a collaboration from the ground up, letting them change certain things that you probably wouldn't change if it was back in the day. And the one of the additions that I've always loved about it is giving brands the ability to add their names onto the tongue, onto the insole, or, you know, embroidered screen print, whatever. It kind of just helps to give it a little bit of a, more of a limited edition feel. Like it's a limited edition colorway because you're not going to see that model in its colorway ever again. But you've also got the hit of the branded on the insole logo, the branded on the logo on the tongue. It just makes it look a bit more special, in my opinion. I do like that. I really do. But it's a shame these aren't sold out because, again, you know, all it takes again in this situation is for an ASAP NAS, a Lucas Sabat, a Rocky to wear them, and suddenly they'll sell out in a heartbeat. But because no one's seen them in a good outfit, because they're not worn by somebody trendy and because they're not panda dunks or jordan ones they just sit there and it's a shame because i feel like sneaker culture this is what i feel like sneakerhead culture was all about back in the day if everyone was wearing air max 90s or air max ones you try and find another air max like a 95 a 98 a tn um uh, you know a 90 whatever 96 even you'd go and dig into your flipping archive dig through the flipping you know, look books, go vintage shopping, dig, dig, dig until you found an Air Max that no one actually had, or even just a colorway no one had, and then you pop those out, and that will be your thing that you'd be wearing. You wouldn't be going out wearing the same old flipping sport red to flipping colorway or blue one because everyone has it. But now there's a feel like there's more sheep ever than before. How many people down the street do you see now wearing Salomons and stuff? They become, they basically turned into a pair of Vans chuckers overnight. You know, even the Vans, people wear the same old ones all the time when it comes to every other sneaker brand. So it's a shame that there isn't that kind of first and desire to be different. And just because someone's wearing the other thing, you try and wear the opposite or try and push yourself to have a more varied collection. Because that's what I remember loving when I used to have boxes stacked up in my room of shoes. I used to love that I had all these different colors. I didn't like, because back in the day, the boxes of Nike were orange and that kind of like brown colorway and that orange colorway. So I hated having all those colors. And also I liked it when back in the day with the SBs, I think every few years they changed their color of the boxes. So what it would be like pink, blue, silver, those old red ones, like normal Nike ones. And it was nice to have all these different color boxes because it meant you were going and buying different SBs from different years and you didn't have just kind of like, you know, standard you know drop release calendar collection is what people have like a dj Khaled collection where he just buys whatever's available has no real discernible taste and whatever's limited he kind of rocks and that's special to him i feel like now that people are a little bit boring so who knows maybe me talking about them maybe we'll buy them but if you don't i'll cop them myself i like them brendan and Asics did a really good job big up everybody over there big up carl eng and i forgot the other guy's name that does it too um, he used to have a really, is it Heavy Mentor or something? I forgot his name. But yeah, big up them over there at Brain Dead for doing the good things and keeping it going and keeping the streets fed with cool and interesting sneakers. Anyway, that has been the Excellent Zing Show episode number 644. Thanks again for tuning in. It's been a pleasure to have your company. As per usual, if it's your first time checking out this show and you want to support and you want to give him back some love, make sure you smash that like button. Make sure you leave me a comment. Make sure you share. Make sure you subscribe. If you're listening to the audio version of the podcast, make sure you're leaving me a review. Five stars preferable, but any stars, I do not mind on any platform that you're listening to this podcast on. That would be well, well appreciated. And of course, links to me can be found in the description. Click the main at the Agassino Zynga Show dot com link that's available in the description i should have probably you know did another url but you know what the vibes are the excellent zinger show dot com in the url you can find more episodes there you can find links to contact me directly you can find my social media links on there also make sure you're doing that if you listen to the audio version of the podcast you'll hear a song of the day coming in as i as i finish up and editing this pod and i'll see you guys again on the other side take care be safe peace